sub two seems to be a little bit popular right now, and it's probably going to get more popular as we go along. Um, I keep an eye on the foreclosure rate, and honestly, we're not there yet. We're, I mean, I'm starting to see an uptick on foreclosures, but not anywhere near the level that we were in 2008. So, with that, this is me. Uh, grew up in Orange County, started real estate in 1975, probably before some of you were born. I was born in 75. Oh gosh. Uh, a broker, investor, mentor, a regional broker for Pelago, which is a real estate company. Um, I do have an office in Laguna Hills, but uh, we're kind of a virtual company. So all of you brand new agents interested in learning about what we do, uh, how we do it, and we don't charge you a lot of money at the end of the day because we're 100% commissioned back to you, uh, let me know. Um, I founded H&M. I'm the H and H and M real real thing. But my daughter and my son in law son in law owned the company because I didn't want to own a real estate company because I'm too old and I let the young people do it. Um, but I still do work there. Uh, I've done over 300 flips since 1975. Um, I think I did like four or five last year, somewhere around there. Alex, you're up. Okay. No I, pressure. I told Joe I wanted to go first because my bio is um, a little slim compared to his, but combined we have over 40 years experience in real estate. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I grew up in Orange County, um, started real estate in 2020. Lauren and I were in a band before and when everything shut down, we pivoted to real estate and um, I can honestly say it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, uh, have a company, Trusting House. We do wholesaling, wraps, rentals, short-term, long-term, all that stuff. Um, I've done over 40 wholesales since 2020, some in SoCal, a lot in um, Jacksonville, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Texas, a lot of virtual stuff. Um, got into creative finance pretty early because I kind of knew um, one, we got really into mobile homes and there seems to be a lot of creative finance through mobile homes because they are, it's kind of hard to get lending on that. So, um, that in combination with just the market, I kind of dove into creative financing, started studying it a lot and it can, uh, see how it's going to benefit us in the next couple of years coming up. And yeah, like I said, flipper, mobile home investor. So that's me. Started in 2020, and by the way, all this setup here was for what they used to do. You know, Lauren sings, and so that's what all this is here. So thank you for bringing all this. I appreciate it. Uh, that's my information. If you uh, need to get a hold of me, and Alex as well. Going once, going twice. Going once, going twice. I hired new real estate agents, by the way. <laughs> okay, what we're going to cover today, wholesaling. Uh, you can't get to sub two without learning about wholesaling, because that's where you find all your leads. So we're going to talk real quickly about that. Uh, maybe not so quickly, but pretty quickly. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop us. And we'll try to answer those questions while we're there. Because uh, if we get to the end, I may forget. Uh, sub two deals, deal structure itself, and then uh, the, an actual deal that we just recently did. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to have lead generation, uh, bandit signs. Does everybody know, uh, let me ask you the opposite way, who doesn't know what bandit signs are? Okay, so bandit signs are these literally signs that you put along the freeways, or uh, inside city streets, we buy houses. Okay, that those are bandit signs, okay? Uh, in Orange County, if you are from Irvine South, I don't recommend putting bandit signs out because Caltrans very aggressive and the cities are very aggressive and they'll take them down as quick as you put them up, okay? If you're gonna do bandit signs, you're gonna do it mostly in Anaheim, Orange, Santa Ana, and inside, uh, you know, the 
the major streets inside inside those cities. Don't put them on the off ramps because I'm telling you, Caltrans is going to come by and take them off. Um, in the 40 years I've been doing bandit signs, I've never gotten in trouble. I ask, I get people ask me that question: You get in trouble? I never have anybody call, but they take them down. So uh, my son-in-law is six seven, and I told him, I said, you know, we're going to go out and put some bandit signs. You're the, going to be the one that puts it up, okay? Because the higher you put it up, if if one of the, you know, Caltrans workers or city workers comes by, they may not have a ladder in their truck, so then they have to go back. So maybe it stays a little bit longer, a day or two instead of like an hour. So, um, and then those signs are put up at one or two in the morning. Okay, you don't want anybody around. So I used to hire young kids to put up my signs. Not something I recommend doing right now. Uh, cold calling. Um, cold calling, and you can be specific, probates or NODs. Does anybody not know what an NOD is? Okay, notice of default. Okay, so when you stop making your mortgage payment to the bank, the bank sends this paper to county recorder's office and says, Alex stopped making his mortgage payment and lets everybody in here know that Alex is in trouble. He hasn't paid his mortgage. This is how much he owes. Do you think those would be good leads? They're, they're excellent leads. You just have to go after them, okay? Those are what I call the low hanging fruit. Yes. Okay, so first you have to find them. Uh, you can use property radar, you can use prop stream to find them. I use property radar, but whatever you want to use. And then it's a matter of skip tracing that address and the name to get a phone. So now you can either call them on the phone, or what I used to do is literally go and knock on their door. 2020, we couldn't knock on anybody's door because nobody wanted to see you in 2020. But we're, we're pretty much back to, you know, you can go knock on people's door. So it depends on how much effort you want to put into it, okay? Direct mail. Um, I can tell you that there's big companies. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to name them, but uh, New Western is one of them. Um, oh, you didn't get that joke, did you? <laughs> New Western is one of them. These are huge companies that send out direct mail. They send out, you know, hundreds, thousands of pieces a month. And I'm sure you probably have gotten them and you look at them and you go in the trash can. That's why I don't recommend direct mail. They, they, they're successful because they do volume. So they're sending out 50,000, you know, mailers a month just to get five or six leads from it. Um, it's something that I don't recommend because, you know, what are you going to pay like 90 cents to a dollar to send out a, a letter? Um, it, you know, if you're sending 50,000 a month, that's a lot of money. Okay. So yes. You mentioned Those are the easiest. Those are the low hanging fruit. Those are the ones that if you decided you wanted to go do wholesaling or, or even try to get a listing in your neighborhood, these are the ones that I would target. I mean, as a normal course of business, if it used to be old time real estate, you have a neighborhood agent. They would literally go by and knock on everybody's door. I still have one that comes by, you know, it's like I've told her I'm a real estate agent, but she still comes by, okay? I'm saying, why waste your time doing all that? Just go knock on these doors that are having difficulty already. Okay. Door knocking. I just talked about it. Uh, websites. So... I've got two websites here, one's for buyers, flipphomesoc.com, and then one's for sellers. We buy ugly old OC homes. Now you can create a website, and believe me, um, 
if, if you create a website, that, that does not mean you're going to be a millionaire tomorrow, okay? Because you have to drive traffic to this website. It has to get noticed. Um, I use a company called Carrot, and they seem to be effective. I get um, buyer leads probably three or four times a month from just my website. I think it's zero from my seller side. Okay, I don't know why, but I do. I get people like yourself, investors, um, you know, signing the form, and then I follow up with a call. What are you looking for? You know, you're just like everybody else. You're looking for a deal. You know, okay, if we find a deal, we'll let you know. Okay. Um, estimating uh, closing costs. You have to be a professional to do that. Okay. Uh, these are the numbers that I use. We use like three and a half to four and a half percent of ARV to estimate closing costs. Um, that, that includes escrow title, commissions, taxes. Uh, we are licensed and sell our own properties. Your number may be different, five to six percent. Uh, out of that, one percent is usually the closing costs. And then five percent goes to commissions, two and a half on buyers, two and a half on listing side. So for us, we don't have the two and a half percent on the listing side, so we save that amount on the listing side. So for example, a sales price of 600,000 uh, at three and a half percent, we're gonna pay $21,000 with all, all the closing costs and all that sort of stuff. And then you can see four and a half and 6%. You don't wanna get to 6%. How much to offer step one, establish what the after repair value is. Does everybody know what after repair value is? Yes? No hands, good. Uh, you can go onto the Pelago website, www.pelago, P-E-L-L-E-G-O.com. That website, you put an address in and it'll run you through all these numbers. And you can change whatever numbers you want. You can change the rehab number. You can change the purchase price. And then it will tell you at the, at the bottom whether the property that you're looking at is a good deal or not, whether you can flip it or not, okay? Um, how much money do you want to make? So in, in my case, I want to make at least 10% of the after repair value. Your number may be different. You Maybe you're starting out and you say, well, Joe, I can make you know 5% and be happy. I mean, I'm jumping up and down 5%. I'm not, but maybe you are, okay? So uh, your number is different than mine. Um, and then establish an offer amount and what I mean by that is a maximum allowable offer. So this is what you're gonna, you can't go over this amount or you're not gonna make any money. So then you need to start way lower, okay? But figure out what that maximum offer amount that you're gonna make, whatever it is you wanna make, and then start low. Uh, don't be afraid to start as low as possible. Honestly, uh, especially with notice of defaults and stuff. I mean, these people, uh, the notice of default process is three months and 21 days after they file this. So literally they give them three months, you know, three strikes. And if they want to pay them what is owed, then they will reinstate that loan. After that, they go into the 21 day foreclosure period and they say, all bets are off. You need to pay us everything you owe us now. So when they're getting down to that 21 day period, if they want to save some money because they have equity in the house, then they're going to get serious about meeting your number or selling it to you at whatever price that is. Uh, example, 675,000, rehab costs 75,000, closing costs 5%, 33,750, profit 10%, 60,000. So my offer amount on that would be 506, 250, okay? We understand the numbers? because that's like super important, the, the thing that you have to understand the most out of doing this. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into this, comping properties, um, you know, other than to say, pools are worth 10,000 to 15,000, and I'm talking, the description of a pool is a, literally a hole in the ground, okay? 
And in some houses that have pools aren't even worth 10 or 15. You start to get into a bigger value, 75 to 100,000, if you walk in the backyard and it looks like a resort, okay? You have like a rock slide and, you know, things like that, barbecue. So the more extensive it is, the more the value of the pool. If it's a literally a pool that was built in the 70s or 80s, it's not worth nothing. It's, it's maybe sometimes a negative. Um, ADU for potential rental income, I, honestly, I don't account for that a lot. You know, it's like, if you don't know, building an ADU here in Orange County is gonna cost you about $300 a square foot. So by the time you figure that out, and it's gonna take you probably a year or more to build that ADU, and then you start doing the calculations, because obviously you're gonna rent it, um, it's gonna take you probably 10 years to pay that money back. And for me, that's why I flip, because I wanna make my money like now, I don't wanna wait 10 years. The other reason I don't hold property, buy and hold in California is for the same reason. If I'm, if I'm cash flowing, let's say $10,000 a year, and I make on a quick flip, I make 70 grand. I mean, how long does it take to make that back if I were to hold on to it? Seven years. I'm not willing to do that, okay? So if you're gonna invest, you probably invest out of state. Uh, this is the Pelago website, so I just wanted to show you that this is how they do the calculations. And so when it comes down here, the rate of uh, return here, that's the number that I'm looking for to be 10% or more. What do they charge for the site? Zero. It's free. Joe, does that site only reflect California properties or what is the property? Right now, California, Washington, Florida, and then there's some other states that they're putting in. But those, those are the three ones. Um, this is the, uh, the flip website, what it looks like. And then this is the, uh, if you want to sell your house, what it looks like. That's, that's my son-in-law. <laughs> uh, sourcing deals, um, become a real estate agent off the MLS. Alex, presented me with a deal a week ago that his mother found in Rancho Santa Margarita because she has a relationship with a real estate agent. And so we went out and took a look at it. I didn't want to personally invest in it, so my son-in-law is investing with uh, Alex on that deal. Um, and we got that, he got that deal because of that relationship. So. It's good to have relationships with agents that might have properties. This was uh, on the MLS, it was coming soon, so it hadn't been activated yet. And uh, the goal of a real estate agent is to do what? Make a commission. What, what's, what's the second most important goal of a real estate agent? Double end the transaction. Oh, the yeah, representing a seller and a buyer. And so agents, we could have written the offer up, but it wouldn't have been accepted because the listing agent is the one that has control and the ear of the seller. So that's how it was accepted, okay? Um, how to find wholesalers. They're, they're all over there. I mean, you can go on Facebook and find them all the time. So go on Facebook and search wholesale groups and just join them and they'll start sending you wholesale deals. They're not all deals. In fact, I'd say 95% aren't deals. Okay, but if you want to look at deals from wholesalers, then look at them. Uh, last year, they got extremely greedy because of the market. It was so hot that they were, you know, making seventy-five to hundred thousand on a wholesale deal. Um, but now I think they're back to reality and more grounded. Uh, an average wholesale deal, you're going to make ten to fifteen around there, I would say. So um, we talked about bandit signs, meetup groups, bigger pockets. If you're not on bigger pockets, it's a good place to to go. LinkedIn. Um, Off-market direct-to-seller opportunities, 
And this is literally pulling lists. We'll pull a list of 200,000 names, um, absentee owners throughout the three counties here, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and we'll skip trace those and we'll put them into a text campaign or we'll send them overseas to a virtual assistant who does nothing but call these people and wait for a yes, I'm interested in selling. Once they get the yes, it comes back here and our team follows up here with that yes. Okay, because you can imagine you've got 200, 300,000 calls you have to make. It's, you can't do it by yourself at all. Where are you pulling your list from? Property Radar, PropStream. There's a bunch of them out there, but those are the two main ones that I use. Do you ever go direct to the title company? Um, you can. They, they, they can give it to you for free, uh, but like anything else, you have to establish a relationship with a title officer. And remember that at the end of the day, if you get a deal put together, you're going to give them the title. Okay, so establish that relationship. Um, some will actually skip trace them for you. That's, you know, whatever they want to do is fine. But yes, you can get them for free there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, trustee sale, um, I haven't done that in a while. You said you were at the trustee yesterday or? No, oh, today. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, that is something that you need to have some experience before you go to a trustee sale because it's not as easy as going to the sale and bidding on something. You need to know if it's the first trustee, second trustee, whether the homeowners association is foreclosing, so there's a lot that goes on at a trustee's sale than just literally going over there. You also need to have cash. Not in your hand, but you need to have cashier's checks. Okay? Ready to go. Because if you're bidding, and they will check to make sure you have the, the amount that you want to bid. If you're bidding and you're the highest bidder, guess what? You hand over those checks, sign them on the back. Two weeks later, they send you out the deed for the property and it's yours, okay? Not a lot of it is going on right now. Um, sources of capital, um, really money flows to the deal. You don't really need the money first. The, if you have a good deal, you just present it to the community or whomever and uh, somebody will say, yeah, I'll partner up with you. Now, what does that mean, partnering up? That means whatever you'd like to do in the deal, okay? If, if you think it's worth giving, you know, half away, half your profit away to somebody who brings you a good deal, that's up to you. If you want to pay them five or $10,000 as a finder's fee, that's up to you, okay? So in real estate, pretty much everything's negotiable. So please negotiate, okay? Uh, learn how to find distressed properties, There'll always be a buyer or partner if the numbers are good. There is more money available than deals. Honestly, that's so very true. You just you just have to find a good deal because a lot of them that you get from these wholesalers aren't aren't that great. Okay. Uh, off market, uh, where the best deals can be found if you are willing to put in the work. Uh, again, direct mail on that's something I recommend. Driving for dollars. Now, if you're not familiar with driving for dollars and there's an app for that, because there's an app for everything, it's called Deal Machine. Um, we get a lot of leads from uh, driving for dollars. Again, we hire 18, 19 year olds to literally drive into neighborhoods, look at the houses and mark down which ones look the ugliest. Okay, so those are type of leads that are not normally available to anybody unless you go driving for dollars. And you can actually do virtual driving for dollars as well. So Google Maps, you get there and you look at it. Um, how do I know it's ugly? Paint is, you know, the yard is in bad condition. Um, if you're not in Santa Ana, you have three cars parked down the lawn. Um, in Santa Ana, that's normal. <laughs> Hopefully nobody lives in Santa Ana, but anyways. 
just moved around. Oh, did you? Okay. So you just get a fourth car and put it on. <laughs> okay. um, so th things like that. So the driving for dollar leads are literally put back into either a text campaign or a cold calling campaign, and you follow up with those. But they seem to be a little bit better. Now, I don't want you driving for dollars and knocking on a door. Okay, so here's here's the door knock. You're knock, you're knocking on the door. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm a real estate investor. I like to buy your house because it looks the crappiest in the neighborhood. <laughs> that doesn't work. Yeah. Why are you here? Well, yeah, because you have a crappy house and I thought maybe you'd want to sell it. Yeah. So don't do that. No. What do you do? Call them or text them. Okay. Cold calling. Uh, Mojo Dialer dials three numbers at once. So if you're into cold calling, it, it's dialing three numbers. The first number that picks up, then it stops, and you can answer the phone and talk to whomever. Okay. Uh, Google ads, Facebook ads. Uh, more, more sophisticated because uh, to do Google, to do Google ads or Facebook ads properly. You're probably going to be spending seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year to get, you know, some leads to flip some houses. Um, it's expensive, you know. It's expensive, and it's it's like it's like um, if you spend, you know, seventy or eighty thousand dollars for these leads, each lead may cost you five thousand dollars. But at the end of the day, if I'm making seventy thousand dollars, what do I care? You know. Yes. Alex, are you calling her? I might have called you before. Um, no. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you're you're probably not a motivated seller. You know what I mean? So they're pulling a list of 10,000, 20,000 people and just going through it. Um, I think the, the average is you sh should be getting about, you know, three to five leads per day with a cold caller. And then out of those, maybe, you know, three for the week or Closing. So, um, so yeah, it's pretty much like the average. It's it's a numbers game, you know. The more money you throw into it, the more leads that you're calling, the more deals you're going to end up with at the end of the day. But um, if you're first starting out, it can get expensive to do it. It can. Um, I, I would I would reach out to uh, Alex. If you want to start wholesaling, I would reach out to him and pick his brain on what he does and the tools he uses and how he does it. Uh, we're actually looking into um, a chat GPT version of answering back the questions from people like, you know, how much you want to offer, things like that, whatever. Get the chat GPT involved in there. Okay. I think that's going to be the future. Okay. Yes. Oh, what do you use for skip tracing? Yeah. Um, yeah, skip tracing is, I mean, you could use that for any list. Um, and it's sort of a debate um, between people because you can pay really, you know, really, you can be cheap about it and pay, you know, one to two cents per lead. And you're going to end up with a lot of wrong numbers, or you can pay all the way up to about 12 cents a lead, um, which it can get expensive. So just depending on your budget, um, it, it, it varies. And there, there's a ton of services out there. Yeah, yeah skip tracing. Batch skip tracing is one. Um, kind skip tracing is another. But you have to have a minimum of, of 10,000 leads. So, but that one you'll get for three cents um, per address. So like $300 for 10,000, it's pretty good.
Yeah, don't don't pay more than that. Yeah, so some of them will charge you like ten cents per day. Yeah, you can get it down to two and three cents pretty easily. Okay, let's get into the meat of uh, subject two deals. Where Alex is going to take over. He's going to talk about all this stuff. Oh boy. Okay. Now, um, yeah. So this is everything as far as uh, you know the contracts and paperwork that you're going to need for sub two deals. Um, it's it's something that you kind of want to when you're talking with the seller. You're going to always want to push a cash offer or tell them that they're going to list it. And so, or, or push them to list it with an agent. Now, if neither of those work, that's when you can kind of broach the subject of subject two, which is different than seller financing. Seller financing is if the home is owned free and clear. Subject two is if they have a mortgage in place that you're going to be taking over. You're going to be purchasing the property subject to the existing mortgage. It's been around a long time. Um, I know when the interest rates were, you know, hitting 16, 17%, the late 70s, 80s, um, you know, people were doing it all the time. But if you bring it up now, I've talked to brokers that have been around for 30 years that are like, oh no, this isn't a thing. It's, it's illegal. You talk to agents, especially agents, they hate it. No, no, it's illegal. It's a scam. It's legal in all 50 states, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just, um, it's not something that people are used to, especially within the traditional space. So, especially when you're talking with the seller, bringing them down that road of, hey, I'm gonna be making the mortgage payments on your behalf and it's gonna stay in your name. They, they need to be in a certain situation to where this works. Um, so, let's start with the sub two creative purchase contract. It's, um, oh yeah, oh yeah, Joe threw this in here. What needs to be in a contract to make it legal? Anyone? Signature bank date. Perfect. <laughs> I didn't see she it. didn't look at it, I saw her. <laughs> Give her a french fry. Um, okay, so it's, it's a purchase agreement with information about the current mortgage that you'll be taking over. Now, this is really important to get the exact numbers from the seller. You'd be surprised. A lot of them don't know, you know what their mortgage payment is. They don't know if it includes taxes and insurance. All that's going to be very important when you're doing your underwriting to see if this is even a deal or not. Someone may be open to selling to you subject to, but you know you run your numbers. Even if you get a long-term renter in there, it doesn't work. Mid-term, short-term, none of that works. Maybe you can wrap it, but you're going to need to know the exact numbers of what they're paying each month to find out if it's a deal or not. Um, and then it will also include any sort of seller financing. So a lot of times they'll have the mortgage plus they'll have equity. So you're going to be paying them out. You're going to be taking over the mortgage and then you're also going to be paying them out on their equity. So it's you know sort of a hybrid deal. So you're going to want to figure out Again, based on your numbers, how much you can afford to pay the seller for their equity. I've worked it out a few times. Let's say you can only take over the mortgage. And if you were to pay the seller out on their equity, that it kills the deal. I've had people take what's called a silent second, saying basically they're going to hold a note for the second for their equity, but you're not going to you're gonna balloon them out or pay them out, you know, years down the road. So that's also an option. Um, you are not assuming the loan. So that's a big distinction. If you're talking with agents, a lot of times they'll say, are you assuming the loan? Um, especially when you're dealing with like a VA loan or something where you, I think you can assume the loan. But yeah, so it's different. That assuming the loan would mean you're qualifying for the loan and they're gonna put it in your name. This is, the loan stays in the seller's name. That's just a big distinction. And then also included in this contract, you're gonna have you know, anything related to the title of the property, disclosures, inspections, closing instructions, default and remedies, anything basically in, you know, in, a, in a simple purchase agreement. And I believe 
um, it's even available within the car agreement. So it's right in there. It's in the, the California Association of Realtors um, normal purchase agreement. It's just I don't think a lot of people use it. So. Okay, we also include addendum um, with our sub two agreements. And this basically shows you, this basically includes that uh, they're gonna be releasing information to you regarding their loan. So they're gonna give you access to all their information. Get, you're gonna wanna get the login. You know, if they have an online portal, you're gonna wanna get the login so you can see exactly how much they owe, do they have any you know, arrears? Uh, so we put that into the addendum. We make sure, hey, I'm gonna be getting this information for you, so if you have a problem with that, then you know, let me know now. Uh, buyer and seller representations and warranties, disclosures regarding the loan, and again, the release of information with the insurance. So that's, that's a big thing as well because you're gonna want the insurance to stay in their name at least till it closes. And then you can figure out if you're gonna get another policy or add yourself as additionally insured, depending on uh, what you're gonna end up doing. We also include acceler uh, seller acknowledgements, which is in the addendum. This is just basically another page that says, hey, you know what's going on. You know exactly what's going on. The loan is staying in your name. I've had to tell a seller over months and months and months where she was like, I thought you were just gonna like take this over. And I'll, no, this, the mortgage is going to stay in your name and I'm gonna be making those payments. And then, you know, just, just so everyone's on the same page. We also include the limited power of attorney. That's for the property mortgage and insurance. That's, that's so you can cover yourself um, in case you need to you know, call the insurance or the mortgage company and um, you know, get access to any information, which is really important. I have a buddy, he got a sub two in Dana Point and he didn't get the login information for the mortgage. Um, he, he got it like $10,000 $10, down at the condo with an ocean view in Dana Point and the seller ended up passing away. And so he didn't have access to, you know, her, her login information so he could keep making those payments. So uh, it became an issue. Authorization to release information. Again, insurance, you just want, basically you just want access to everything. Limited power of attorney, insurance, mortgage, all that stuff. Um, it's just like any other transaction. You can do inspections. Yeah, and I would. I would do inspections. It's it's pretty much like every every other transaction, except that you're going to be you know making the mortgage payments on their name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I tell them that I can do what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure, pre-sign it, meaning, and then, uh, meaning we can, it, basically something that stipulates if I miss a payment for a certain period of time, if I don't make a payment within, let's say, 45 days, then they'll get the, the mortgage back in there, or they'll get the deed back in there. Yeah, so there's a few ways around it. Again, like I said, it's like they have to be in a certain situation. And then where are we on? Memorandum and quick claim. So I always try to file a memorandum whenever I get the seller to enter into agreements with me. And basically what, that's, what that does is that clouds the title. It says, hey, you know, I already have a agreement with this seller. So um, if, you, if for whatever reason the, they ghost me and they try to go around my back and get another, you know, get another deal or, or sorry, get another 
Offer, thank you. Then it clouds the title and then that buyer needs to come to me and we basically buy them out. So. Do, you, do you think that uh, sellers would not try to do that? Like they get your call, you put a deal together, a week later they get a call from another wholesaler that says, oh, I'll pay you 10,000, 20,000 more after you have a signed contract. They, they try to do that. This will help you at the end of the day. Um, I've had situations where I've had to hire an attorney to sue the seller and complete the transaction. So it happens. So just trying to protect yourself here in an easier way because once you record this, it is on the title to the property. If anybody pulls a preliminary title report, it'll show. Yes. So the title company is doing all of this for you. You're just saying, I want all of these things. Or how does that, how does that happen that it was on there? No, we, we, we do everything. So this, this memorandum and quick claim, whatever it is, it's just a document. And then the title, we record it at the title yeah. company, okay. not there, not there, but at the recorder's office. Title company just sees it when it's done. Yes. Or do you have templates that you provide to like maybe somebody who's trying to get into wholesaling and they're helping? I do, yes. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. It's California law. Allow you to record that memorandum with just you, the buyers, signing, or do you require the seller to sign with the buyer? Um, great question. Maybe it's just the buyer. Yeah, I think it is. Now you have to understand when you're working. Like for a not you're not working for a government agency, but you're dealing with a government agency. The recorder's office is there to record whatever you want. It could be a piece of toilet paper. They're going to charge you for recording that documents, and that's all they care. They're not, you know, validating that document. They're not saying it's truthful. They're not saying it's even valid in any way. It could be fraudulent. I mean, there's a lot of fraud that goes out there. They just record it and they collect the fees. So. Yeah, we've, we've never had a problem with that. They record whatever we give them, okay? I do get the seller to sign anyway, though, just in case. But is it valid if the uh, seller doesn't sign? I think it depends on each state. What about California? Joe would know that. What was the question? Is it still valid if the seller doesn't sign? Uh, yeah, you, you can you can record it. Again, they're just going to record it. And then um, it clouds the title for a period of time. There's actually some documents that are recorded that you can remove from title. Um, you know, it, it, it depends what those are. Um, you can have them removed by title or they can do what they, they call right around it. So there's some documents out there. I, the most that they have issues with is um, like if you're married and then one person, you know, says, well, I'm going to quick claim this to myself or my sister or whatever. Um, you've just definitely put a cloud on the title. And you might not be able to sell that property because the title company is not going sure. They're going to come back to you and say, did you authorize this? And if you did sign this form here and then we'll keep going. But if you didn't, no. California is very, very stringent on that. If you're married, um, domestic partners, whatever, everybody needs to sign, okay? And so, and same thing with wholesaling, if you're dealing with um, a husband or a wife, you need to get both of them to sign at the end of the day. You don't have a deal until everybody's signed, okay? Even if the spouse or partner is not on the mortgage or title? No, if they're not on there, then no. No, no, yes. Is there a reason why we're going through the memorandum thing versus getting the grant deed and doing that? Because you're purchasing all. Yes, we're, he we're headed there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Amber. It's more getting the seller on board with what you're wanting to do. Once you get the seller educated, 
and they agree. And remember, this could be a 30-year loan. They've been paying for 10 years, so there's 20 years left. If they agree that you're going to take over this loan, it's going to be in their name for 20 years. It's never going to show up in your name or your investor's name. It's going to be in their name. So every time they do a credit check or if they want to buy another house or whatever, it's going to show up there. Okay. So it's just, it's just an education process on that end. And it, it takes a lot of talking. Okay. Yes. Could I officially advertise on MLS like so we need to do such a cool or something like that? Yeah, why not? I, I, I did a deal the other day and I was offering seller financing on the whole thing. Somebody bought it and they got a loan, thank God, because I didn't really want to sell or finance it, but um, I thought I could sell it easier if I, if I offered seller financing. So yes, you can. I have a search on my MLS that looks for deals like that, like owner willing to carry, those type of deals. They'll come up on, a, on an MLS search for me, and those, those are the ones that I'm reaching out to. How much do you want down? 5%, 10%? It's all negotiable. Depends how, you know, hard they want to sell it. Go ahead. So what do you do if you offer seller finance and they say, we want to take you up on it, but we're going to get a, a first for like 50%, 60% or whatever, and, you know, will you come in second position? Well, it depends who you're talking to and how you're structuring the deal. Um, I know that banks don't like to see anything behind them when they give a loan to a buyer. Um, at least it used to be like that. I don't know if it's changed, but I can't see that it's changed. The only way it would um, like kind of work is if you're doing seller financing. So let's say you get a loan for 500000 on a million dollar house and the seller's willing to take back 250,000 in that deal, it, it may work. But again, the, the first trustee, whoever's loaning you the money needs to know all that stuff, that that's gonna happen. And um, it is mortgage fraud if you close a transaction and then say, I'm gonna pay you $250,000 after we close. Because I've seen that before too, so. Be careful what, what you do and how you do it. So back up earlier, Alex, you were talking about the mortgage and insurance. Um, I, I know that, I mean, I know that legal in 50 states and everything, but is the bank going to get notified if the seller discontinues his mortgage insurance and it, and it pops? I mean, isn't, that, isn't the bank going to go, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Is that an issue? The, yeah, that's why you want to leave the insurance in their name, put yourself as additionally insured, and then get another insurance policy once you have the deed recorded in your name. So maybe this is a little too far in the weeds, but how do you deal with, can you get accounts from those people? Do you change the password? Should they have the passwords? How, how does... Yeah, I I would. I mean, that's that's the first thing I'd want to mm -hmm. change. Yeah, exactly. You didn't come back here and mess with the mortgage call the mortgage company and be like, hey, I didn't know this was going on or, or anything like that. So you're, you're basically taking control of that. Can you claim the depreciation off of that uh, house or does that still go to them? No, you can. You're paying it. Whoever pays it. Whoever, Whoever pays, pays it. it. Doesn't it doesn't matter what that means. It doesn't matter. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Anything else? I was just going to say, um, Regarding on-market deals, uh, I'm seeing a lot of traction with people who are trying to list their properties right now and have no equity. So if you can pull a no equity list, expired listings, those are those are good sellers to go after for subject to. I'm sorry, would you say that again? No equity, uh, no equity list. So they have no equity and they're trying to sell. When they sell, they're going to have to come out of pocket. So. If you do an expired listing, no equity, you know they want to sell, that would be a good candidate for subject to. Wholesale purchase contract. Just use that in a, in a standard cash sale. 
Yeah. Finder's fee agreement, that's, you know, if you're gonna wholesale it or you get it from a wholesaler, you can just use that. Okay. Let's talk about uh, deal structure itself. So I, I started doing this literally 40 years ago, interest rates, um, I won't tell you who was the president at the time, Jimmy Carter, um, was in office. When I bought the house that I'm currently living in, I was paying 16% interest. Mind you, it was only 160,000. I bought a brand new from the Mission Viejo company. Um, I had to sell my house to buy, to buy the house that I'm in now, and we did creative financing back then. So it was just like you said, the purchaser got a first, I took back a second on the property, so that's seller financing. And it was for five years, and then five years later, the market started doing this again, so he was able to refinance and pay me that off, okay? So here we are, fast forward, uh, same thing, just obviously bigger numbers. So you can do creative financing. An all-inclusive trustee, and you were talking about the trustee. So this is just basically, this is, the, this is what's going on with this property. It's got a loan of 250,000 first. It's got another loan of 250,000 second. It's got a HELOC on it for 200,000 third, okay? And the people that you're buying it from the sellers have little or no equity, and you're telling them, I can help you out Okay, so you're gonna do an all-inclusive trust deed. You're gonna wrap all those loans together into one, and then you're gonna take this trust deed and you have a decision to make. One, you can record it, because remember, you get the recorder's office is gonna record anything. The recording basically puts everybody on notice that now you own this property through an all-inclusive trust deed, and it literally spells on there, I'm taking over the first, the second, and the third. Okay, and that's the safest way to do it. If, if you can't sleep at night, you don't have to record it. And the reason why you don't record it is because most loans today, they didn't 40 years ago, most loans today have what's called a due on sale clause. The due on sale clause means that when you sell it or transfer it to somebody else like this, they want their money. Okay, it is just literally a clause in their contract. In the 40 year plus that I've been doing this, I have never heard of a bank calling a loan due. As long as you're paying them, and especially nowadays with computers, they're literally checking a box, oh, we got the payment for this property. They don't care who it came from, they just care that they, that they got it, that's it, okay? That doesn't mean that somebody's gonna find out um, and they may call the loan due. And I know that um, you know once you're involved in a transaction like this, um, you have to remember at the end of the day as well that the banks really don't want these properties. They want the loan because that's where they're generating their income. So then if you, know, if you stop paying them, they're gonna have to foreclose on you and they don't wanna do that. So you, you just call them and negotiate and say, you know, hey, I'm making the mortgage payment. The people that you had this uh, kind of walked away from this situation and I bailed it out for you and I've been making the mortgage payment for such and such. Hopefully that's okay with you. Most of the time they're going to agree. If they don't, then hey, okay. You know, time for you to foreclose. Three months, 21 days. You can sell the property before that happens. Okay? So that's your kind of ex ex exit strategy if that happens. But I can tell you that 40 years, I have never heard of a bank foreclosing on somebody in this type of situation. They, they, they don't get the recorded documents. The only time they're gonna start to question anything is you've stopped making the mortgage payment. Uh, the insurance is lapsing, so make sure that that doesn't lapse because they need to protect their interest in the property. That's why they have insurance on there. So. Um, all inclusive trustees is what I use. So, are, are, are you saying don't record that, or are you saying do record? Depends on how good you want to sleep at night. 
Okay, if you want to be 100% protected, then record it. If you want to roll the dice and not it, let anybody know that you own this property, remember, you own it on a piece of paper that has a notary signature on it, but that's it. This is a piece of paper, and you have that piece of paper, so nobody else knows it. Okay, my fear, if I don't record it, is the seller is going to sell it to somebody else. Okay, so I like recording them, but again, that's up to you. you know? recording is usually, people don't record it because they're worried about the view on sale fraud. Correct. Yes. What about the insurance? Isn't there some kind of insurance that, that you can also purchase that in case the view on sale clause comes? Yep. Do you want sale clause insurance? <laughs> <laughs> And basically, I think you pay into it, and then they'll refinance you out if it gets if it gets you know, called. But it's it's typically, from what I've seen, it's typically smaller banks, maybe credit unions, where they're looking at every single mortgage and you know on top of it. The bigger the bank, the better off you are. Would the buyer that uh, that sells the property have to put it in a trust or will it? So we're, we're purchasing these properties with our LLCs. So my LLC is owned by my trust. So then my children, if something happens to me, would have control over that property. Is that what you're asking? Yes? Okay. Oh, are you asking about the buyer or the seller? The buyer. Yeah, the buyer, yes. So, I mean, if you wanted to buy it as an individual, you can, I don't recommend it. Um, you should buy it as a, a trust, a family trust. And I don't like that either because what do most people name their trust? Their name. Yeah, their name. It's like, hello, you know, it's like, yeah, it's in my family trust. It's Joe in my wife's name, Holmes, family trust. So I do LLCs or I actually do a land trust which is totally different as well, to protect yourself and privacy. Is there any attorneys in the room? No? Good. <laughs> uh, lease option is another way to take down properties. Lease option, you never give away control of the property itself. You always own it. You're just recording um, and having the um, buyer seller sign a piece of paper that basically says you're gonna buy it for this price so lease options are always favored to the seller okay so for example let me give you an, a good example like if your property's worth a million dollars and somebody says i want to do a lease option but i i don't have the money okay joe how, how much do you have I have 100,000, okay, we'll use that as your option money, okay? So you give me 100,000, I will sell you the house for a million in three years, five years, whatever we agree to. During that time, you're making a payment to me, a lease payment to me, I still own the property. Those lease payments, and all this is negotiable, those lease payments goes towards like your down payment, or it doesn't. If you want to structure it, five years down the road, this million dollar property, if it's in this market, maybe it goes down to 500,000. So who does that benefit? That benefits the seller. Because the buyer's gonna say, well, yeah, I have it under contract for a million, but why would I want to buy it for a million? It's worth 500,000. So then he bails out, there goes his $100,000 option money, and that goes in your pocket. So that's why I'm always saying it's lease options is really a benefit for the seller. Now, if you time the market wrong and you're in 2008 and you get a lease option for 500,000 and then seven, eight years later that property's worth 2 million, then yeah, you got a good deal there. But most of the time when people start looking at lease options it's because they don't have enough money to put down on a property and it's really inflated. So it only helps the seller in my opinion. So you can do lease options. Uh, grant deed is just simply how, you know, property is transferred. 
from one person to the other, you can do a grant deed. You know, there's, there's no problem doing that. I, I would recommend an all-inclusive trustee, but you can do a, a grant deed as well. It Does, doesn't matter. Uh, the all-inclusive trustee is going to um, basically show everything that you're doing. So you're, you know, assuming the first, second, third. A, a grant deed is just, you know, them giving you um, the property without anything underneath it. Um, always pull a preliminary title report. Who does not know what that is? One, two. Um, so a preliminary title report is supplied by a title company. A title company is an insurance company, a product. When you buy and sell a house, the seller gets title insurance to basically tell the buyer, this is what's happening with the house. There's a first, there's a second, there's a child support lien, um, there's an IRS lien. I'm going to pay all that, so don't worry about that. And then I'm going to pay for the insurance to make sure that that's the only thing on the property. You close on the property the next day, you're, you feel safe as a buyer because you know there's nothing else. Two months, a year goes by, and all of a sudden, a contractor's lien appears on there. And you didn't hire a contractor. And so you go back, and a contractor like said, well, I filed the lien. When did you file it? Well, it was before your closing. So guess what? Now you have to call the title company and the title company obviously made a mistake because we're all human and they didn't find that. They are responsible for paying it. That's what the insurance part is about, okay? So whenever you buy properties, you should always get title insurance on the properties. The only time you don't is if you go to the courthouse steps. Courthouse steps, you're buying it as is, where it is, as where, whatever. You're buying it, and whatever pops up at the end of the day, that's your responsibility. When I go to the courthouse steps, when I used to go, I call the title company because there's a special number that they have for flippers. And you call them, and they literally do a title search right then and there. Um, because, again, we're in a computer age, so everything's there. And they tell me, okay, Joe, you're bidding on a first trustee and there's nothing there. There's no uh, tax lien. There's no um, contractor's lien. There's nothing else. But I can tell you that I paid some of those before because, again, you're, you're working with numbers. And if you, if you can bid this amount and, and uh, the bank's good with that amount, if there's an extra... 10 or 15,000 for child support, you're paying 10 or 15,000 extra. If that doesn't go above what you wanted to pay, then you pay it. So I, I pay for tax liens, child support, things like that, that show up there. But again, that's why I said, when you go to the courthouse steps, you, you better educate yourself. You should know what you're doing before you get there. Uh, getting control of seller's banking information online, and, and Alex talked about that. So the more control you can get, the better. So well, we took total control over that account. And I mean, I log into it and uh, I pay the mortgage every month. Um, he's gonna talk about it, but we're in a process. There is, uh, uh, he'll talk about it. Uh, he talked about this additionally insured on seller's insurance. Uh, what does an actual deal look like? Your turn. Okay. Yeah, so Joe and I, are um, we took down a deal out in San Jacinto. This came from just a, a typical text blasting of absentee owners out in Riverside County. And it started pretty much like most texts. I texted, hey, are you looking to sell your property? She says, it's already listed. Go ahead and reach out to my agent. And... Um, I saw that it was in foreclosure. And so before I went to the agent, I went back to her. I said, hey, what's, you know, kind of what's going on? Can you just let me know, you know, what's going on with the property before I put an offer in? It was listed for $550. And she texted me back, you know, if you give me $450 right now through my agent, I'll accept. So I was like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. What's going on? So I was like, okay, well, yeah, I'll go through your agent. 
but I didn't. I kept pressing her. I said, like, hey, can we just, you know, get on the phone really quick and, you know, chat about what's going on? And she kind of hinted there were some tenant problems. So I was like, perfect, even better. And so I called her a couple times. She didn't answer. And you're going to see that a lot with foreclosures. They're just, they're going through so much that a lot of times they'll just ghost you, but you just stay persistent. Finally, I got, I got through to her and I just, I used the line that I always use. I was like, hey, can you just kind of catch me up to speed with what's going on? And right from there, right from the beginning, she goes, I'm just going to be honest with you. And then just went into the whole story. Uh, her sister had moved into the property. They were partners on a sober living house. And the mortgage was in the seller's name, but her sister was supposed to be paying the mortgage. She hadn't been for the last five years. And so it was in foreclosure. There was also a second attached to the house that had defaulted back in 2010, I believe. It had ballooned out. It was for 76,000 and now that's actually the lender that was foreclosing on the company or uh, on the seller. They wanted 180,000 at this point. So I was like, huh, interesting. And she basically just said, you know what? I would give you my house right now. I'll just give it to you. And I was like, all right, let me see what I can do. So I brought it to Joe and we ran the numbers and as it, as it was, it wasn't really going to work out, but I just told her, okay, if you do exactly what I tell you, we may be able to help you. And this was about four days before it was supposed to be auctioned. She had listed it on the market. It had been on market for about 50, 60 days and they weren't getting any traction because the tenant, the sister that was living there wasn't letting anybody in. They had a buyer lined up, but she wasn't letting anybody in. So, you know, everybody pretty much backed out and it was down for the last four days. And so I was like, all right, so what you need to do, you got to cancel the listing agreement. So she did that. And then we got on a three-way call with the second and I was able to get them down from 180. I wanted it at around 75 for it to work. And then they ended up coming back at 100,000. And so what they did is the day of the auction, they stopped it. They gave us another 30 days and they said, all right, if you give us 100,000 on the second, then, um, you know, we'll, we'll call it even. And so we decided to take that and we took over the first. So that was the main part. We didn't want to come out of pocket for the whole, the whole amount. So we paid off the second and then we're taking over the first and then basically the house, it honestly doesn't need that much work. So we're just going to put like maybe, you know, 10, 15 grand into it and then relist it. So you, you're subject to the first. Exactly. The yeah, exactly. Because that's, that's who was actually foreclosing was the second. And then the first was beginning. It had gone to the legal department. So she had, she had I think they owed maybe like 19 grand or something. So you said they were making payments for five years? It was, yeah, I think, I think she had not made payments for five years, caught up, and then was like working it out. Exactly. And then, yeah, for sure. And then she was like working it out, making partial payments, did the whole thing with like loan modifications. They were trying to make it work, but it just, exactly, exactly. So had it foreclosed with the second and not have gotten anything? The first one has been out, I think, right? The first one. No, no, they, no. Yeah. Yeah. Second gets screwed, right? Yeah, did you go in the negotiation part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got them down to like hundred grand. Yeah. Because if it forecloses, they end up with nothing. Second. No, there's still there's still equity there. Okay. They still they would have owed whatever was on the first, and then they could have resold it, and I guess you know captured whatever okay. equity was yeah. in there. But. They, they were just trying to do a quick sale, get their money quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still so, there. yeah. That's what I was kind of using. I was like, "Hey, you know, you're not going to be able to sell this for the hundred eighty thousand. Like, no one, you know, no one's going to want to take that on with the tenants." I just kept pushing that, and then finally, we're we're down to negotiate. Were you able to then negotiate with the tenants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I finally got a hold of the tenants, and 
I, I did the walkthrough, and Joe wanted me the day of to be like, hey, you guys got to be out. You guys, like, you guys have to get out. Um, but, like, while I was, like, walking through, the guy was, like, begging me. He's like, you got to be able to do something for me, man. You got to. And so I just left. I was like, all right, I'll try to do something for you. And then Joe's like, no, you need okay. to go back and tell <laughs> let, let me tell you this real story. <laughs> yeah. Is that the sugar? Yeah, yeah. I sent them out there because we needed to look inside the property. So he went out there, knocked on the door. They were kind enough to let him in. Lord was with them, so um, let me know if I'm not telling. Oh, you stay in the car. Okay. So um, he gets there and he starts taking pictures inside. And I told him, I said, when you're there, take the cash for keys document with you and start negotiating these people out of this property. Uh, so he takes the pictures and stuff, and, and I'll show you some of the pictures. He takes the pictures and stuff. He goes out. They leave from there, and they call me, and they go, Joe, yeah, this is what we did. I go, are they moving? You know, did you like offer cash for keys or did you tell them, you know, like here's here's my process. I'm going to give you three, five thousand dollars, whatever it is to get you out right away. Uh, if not, then I'm going to hire an eviction attorney. The eviction attorney cost me about twelve hundred dollars. So actually less expensive, but it takes a longer period of time, which is where we're at right now. I go, did you run through that story? I mean, maybe try to scare him out. You know, the, the sheriff is going to come over at the end of the day and, you know, a victim, get him out. No. What? <laughs> it, was, it was hard to say that to his face. So I told him to go back. Yeah. He went back, but unfortunately, by the time he went back and knocked on the door, the guy was not going to answer the door. No, he didn't answer the door. You know? So... Again, he's been doing this since 2020, so this is a learning process for him. I and still have a heart. That's the problem. And that's 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 the learning process. No, you. I mean, you can have a heart, but this you have to treat this as a business. And if you don't, you're going to end up losing money at the end of the day. So I, I mean, I won't actually tell you what I told him <laughs> afterwards because I am. She was in the car, so she heard it. You know. <laughs> But uh, anyways, so are you done here? Tenants? Tenants yeah, are still yeah. there. We're yeah. in the process of evicting them as we speak. Did you go through all that? No. Numbers? The numbers. Um, Hold on, real, real quick. So uh, the eviction process, I know it was halted for a little while. Mm -hmm. It's gone away. And it's like it's totally gone away except in Los Angeles. That's why I don't do anything in Los Angeles. Yeah, everywhere everywhere else it's back to the same. And if you listen to, I don't want to pick on real estate agents that are inexperienced, but if you listen to inexperienced people tell you that um, you can't do it, you can, you can. You know, you just have to know how to do it. Hire the right people to do it. Anthony. So if, if you get a sign, Yes. Oh, wait a second. You you must be related to Alex. <laughs> because you think I'm going to give them the money after they sign the contract? No, no, no. I'm saying, like, they sign the contract. Yes. And then you're still having, you know, I mean, the sheriff comes there or whatever. <laughs> They sign the contract. They agree to move out on a certain date. I tell them, awesome. I will come back on that date with your money. And it better be empty. And then I will pay you. Again, I don't believe anybody that says anything, especially tenants. So I tell them, you've signed this. Awesome. That's great. I am still starting the eviction because I don't want to wait 30 days and then have to start the eviction 30 days later. So if you move out at the right time, I will call my attorney and I will stop the eviction. Okay? Yes. 
Yes. It's, it's e easy insurance money is what it is. Yes. It's worth the money. Yes, because, you know, there's been many times that, oh, yeah, we're going to move, we're going to move, oh, yeah, we'll sign here. You know, they don't move. And what are you going to do? They don't have any money anyway. You can't sue them, you know. Yes. Alex, are you a realtor? No. No. Oh, my question was, if he is a realtor and he contacted seller for property that's listed, he's not allowed, right? Because Correct. That's why you pick him. That's, that's why I sick Alex on them. Okay, because he's not a real estate agent. Lauren is taking um, her test right now, right? You're studying for that? Don't do that. A couple of weeks? Yeah. Ooh, wow, getting close. So no, we don't want Alex to get his license. Lauren can do all his stuff because she's correct. Ethically, like real estate agents are ethical. Like, oh my God, that's like news to me. But anyway, if you're an ethical agent, you're not supposed to contact the seller in a transaction. That's unethical. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't have a license. Okay, another question? No, you good? Just kind of shaking your hat. Well, they, they were, they were there, they were, they actually did a rehab to the house. Oh, okay. They rehabbed the kitchen and stuff like that. Not to my taste, but they did. Um, and so they, they had permission to be there. It's not like they found the place empty and they moved in. Okay. That, that's kind of the definition of squatter to me. It's like, you know, let's go find an empty house and move into it. So they have a lease agreement with, uh, Well, yeah, they're not that sophisticated. Okay. They didn't have a lease agreement. No, but that's a question you need to ask all the time because um, if they do have a lease agreement, you have to honor it. Yeah, yeah. So I always ask. Uh, case study. The deal is in San Jacinto, California. We got it through texting the lead. Um, the first trust deed was around 300K at 4%. The second was, I believe, originally at 78K, and then it had gone up to 180K, and then I got it down to 100. And we paid the second and took over the first on a sub two, and the ARV is about 550. Can you see the interest rate there? 4%. I mean, F. F What's that? Are, is there like, are you paying her like a difference? No, that? no. She she said, here, you can have it. So there's there's nothing we're paying her. There's no, is there like uh, walk away money? No. Just no, she, she wasn't living in the property. Okay, she, was, she was out. Yes. Uh, we basically like saved her credit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's also like something you need to bargain for. Something. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, yeah, we're gonna flip it. You paid the hundred right? Yes. Mm -hmm. it just got filed, so it's probably gonna be like another sixty days or something until they're fully out, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Then yeah, maybe another like thirty days, so ninety days out to list. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't go there. Yeah, I just have, now I've just made connections to where I can have um, other people go out there. Sometimes, or I'll just find like a newbie that wants to learn, and so I'll just have them go, hey, I need you to go walk this duplex for me, so. <laughs> like, okay, perfect. Yeah, there's squatters' rights too, and it's 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 a certain. I just dealt with that with a mobile home, and it was the seller's ex-husband, who's he wasn't on title or anything, didn't have a lease agreement. He just he he broke the window and started living in there, 
And so we we thought maybe if we just locked him out, we didn't have to go through the eviction process, but the way their laws were set up, we had to just go through the whole the whole thing, the whole eviction process, and because he, he was able to you know claim possession. You just have to go through the whole process. Like we thought maybe if we just lock the doors and then put no trespassing, we'd be able to you know be fine with that. But it, it was I realized they have squatter rights there, so. That's, What can you what can you do besides taking the small claims for it? Take, take the front door off. Yeah. <laughs> Serious? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I like Jay's. Oh, I mean, like, okay, so, so you have, let's say you own the house, and somebody breaks in, isn't that fine? Yeah, 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 I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. And then, but I'm, maybe if it's like a vacant house and you're not there all the time, but then. They're just, no, we live here now. I don't know exactly what the stipulation is, but. Well, but the house I did, I think, 30 days. How much would you say you make a memory for Probably, yeah, somewhere around 10 to 15. I, I usually keep it around that just because that's how I'm able to send stuff to buyers and then know that going to get a response you know if you, if you try to inflate it by putting 25 or 50 in there a lot of times it makes it too skinny of a deal to where the buyers are just you know they just get over it after a while maybe this might be a question for Joe as time gets closer to the end of the do you guys still have like hey instead of like three thousand dollars you get a thousand you're out like a month or 60 days now you know lower than that the and eviction attorney basically calls you and says, don't, don't accept any money from them and don't talk to them anymore. So they, they can do their whole process. <laughs> it's pretty much too late. But when I, when I brought up the cash for keys, they're just like, no. And then they were planning on suing her sister. So then they, they were saying, oh, well, we're going to get an attorney and then sue my sister. And so they're thinking that they're just going to stay there. Exactly. Yeah, they they were coming up with a bunch of stories. Alex, how long does it take? Uh, I think 90, 90 plus twenty one days for foreclosure. Yeah, and then twenty one days till the auction. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of times yeah, they'll work it out with them, and, you know, if, if they can. Yeah. How long did the attorney say about the eviction? Um. Yeah, probably. I'm trying to think what we did. He, it's it's kind of it's all over the place depending on. So for them, they didn't have a lease agreement, so it was called it was called like uh, tenant at will. And so they have to go and then serve them with, I think, like a 30-day to pay or quit. Um, and then after that, they'll serve them with the actual eviction lawsuit. And then they have five days to respond to that. And then if they respond, then they'll file for a court date. And then they'll go in and, and then basically you get the judgment at that point. And then depending on what the judge you know, says like, okay, give them, if you, if you give them 30 days, then, you know, then they'll be out then. Or I've seen it to where they're like, hey, can you give them 60 days, depending on, you know, what it is. So it's kind of all over the place. Exactly, yeah, it's just holding costs and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Totally. Totally. Yeah. So that's why you know knowing the exact numbers and, and all that is analyzing. Yeah. 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 
the one I got in Florida was the, the addiction had already gone to like the last second, and so I took it over. And then they were like, "Oh, three days are gonna have the tenant out," so that worked out, Marty. Yeah, oh, wow, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it go, like, since 2018. I've seen some that were in default since 2018. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how they keep pushing it, but they can keep getting extensions, you know, from the lenders. Auction, you're gonna to want to get, you know, you're gonna to want to get an extension. That's what we said. Like, hey, you can stop the auction a lot of times if you have a purchase agreement in hand, and you say, hey, I, I'm gonna purchase this property. We just need an extra 30 days to close on the property. So they'll they'll say okay, or maybe not. No, I, I can't. I got on a three way call with them. The set, not, the, not the primary. The no, I did with the primary as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And basically, just, she said, hey, Alex is going to be handling this account, so give him access to everything. And I'm like, okay. And then at that point, I just found, I figured out, because she, there was a arrears, I think it was around, around like, what, what it was, like 19 grand. And they were okay with you taking it over? I didn't mention that part. Oh, just give me access. Yeah, yeah. Just give me access. This is like, you know, we're just helping her. Yeah, power of attorney or something like that. Okay. They honestly don't ask any questions as long as you're getting paid. Exactly. Yeah. So what I would, if I was going to pitch it to you to, as a buyer, I would, I would call it the entry fee. So I'll say, hey, your entry fee is the arrears. How much is owed back? So let's say it's like nine grand. Yeah, bring it current. Um, how much is the rehab? Let's say it's another like 10 grand. And then my fees, 10 grand. And then closing costs is 10 grand. So your entry fee is going to be 40 grand to get into this deal. And that includes everything. And then that's, and then you've already got it separate to Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I would just keep paying it, um, but I'm not quite sure. I don't know if they get if it's uh, due on sale clause or anything gets gets tripped at that point. But I don't I don't think so. Joe, what do you do about that? Um, if the 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 person passes away that has the mortgage in their name. Nobody's going to find out if you're making your mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why. Get a death notice? That's, the bank will get a death notice, right? <coughs> they may. <make. laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, he's almost still the owner of that estate. Doesn't matter, that estate still paying all this bills. It says the Microsoft Edge. Are you, is this from your iPhone? Yeah, yeah there's your problem. Yeah. I gave you an iPhone high definition. Yeah. That's what I was confused. <laughs> Wait, do you have these on your iPhone yeah. right now? Yeah, then just can you mirror the yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, mirror your phone and see. Yeah, mirror the phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, it's a good thing. There's probably an online converter, too. Yeah, wait. Give me Dropbox. Good idea. Oh, there we go. Oh, you got it. Nice. So Dropbox is a Oh, that's good. Okay, yeah, we got it. Thank you, Rami. We got it. Yay. Rami always fixes it. <laughs> okay, go ahead, start talking. Okay, so as you can see, they they were they were receiving money because they were running it as a you know sober living house. They just weren't paying the mortgage with it. So as you can see, and they were they were all happy to say like we did all this stuff. You know, we 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 paved the side yard and. And we got this RV ramp in here. And they put in new gates. An and RV. RV. And, a, and a Corvette. Corvette. A new Harley. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. So. Um, uh, yeah, it has a nice backyard. This is this is a pen for an animal. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes, wow. it's a palapa, I believe it's called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's decent. I mean, it's, um, they painted it a weird color, but, uh, yeah, it's got a nice, nice backyard. Just needs to be cleaned out. You know, it's not like That's the terrible. remodel kitchen that they did. It's not bad. No. You'll see the colors that they chose for inside the house. <laughs> really nice colors. Okay, come on. I know. He can have him turn that off for the next time he has to show some. Just regular Android. No, no dev. So that's the living room. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And you know, all the other houses on the block are just a typical, you know, tan on tan on tan. So I'm guessing maybe that's what we're doing. Pretty much the whole house is like that, you know. Lots of furniture in it, lots of different colors. Did they take the furniture or leave it? It's still there. They're still there. Yeah. Yeah. This is a story in progress. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> Do we continue in the next hey, session? <laughs> You know, if they don't leave, you guys could just move in. You know, that was... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's how we. That's how we ensured our renters got out. We just moved in and oh, yeah, moved exactly. out. There you go. You yeah. better. <laughs> Start carrying boxes in. <laughs> we did. We got extra roommates. <laughs> My wife called ahead of time. We're gonna start putting things in the back. We'll oh, there you go. It up. They were gone. 
I told him we could possibly work something out. So he wasn't letting anybody in there. I was like, hey, if you let me take pictures, I might be able to do something. And so that's that's part of the reason why he was like, hey, if you can if you can do anything. Yeah. This is a picture of the garage. Okay. Wait, what the? Do we do we know what's there? Is that an old? That's a real pig. Is it real? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a real pig. Full side pig. And then Alex says, Well, what if they leave it? And I go, We have a barbecue and a party. <laughs> and then Lauren, she's like an uh, animal person, and she says, No, we can't do that. And I go, Why not? We can. Yes. Barbecue. We went, Alex and I went to look at some property a few months ago or whatever, and this place was major distress. We come out and there's a distressed cat outside. I mean, this poor thing was like dying. And so Alex took some pictures, sent it to Lauren. She sent it to no, his no, mother? No, no, no. no. My mom saw it on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Her mom saw it on the Instagram. They went over there and got the cat. Rescued the cat. The cat's been adopted by a Coto de Casa family. <laughs> Is living in a Coto de Casa house. Oh my God. The picture that Lauren sent me was a cat on a boat. <laughs> so it went from a bad life to a good life because of her. Better than all of yeah. us. Pig barbecue, and you're all invited. <laughs> uh, that's it. Any other questions? It was all for the pig photo. <laughs> yes. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so if you want to do this, or you have some deals, you want to learn more, please reach out. Uh, let me know if you find a deal. Uh, you want to partner up with us? It's fine. We can do that. You know, it just depends on what that looks like at the end of the day. So just let me know. Any other questions? No other questions? No? Okay, so you're free to network at this point. Uh, I appreciate you all coming out. If there's any food left, please take it. Um, again, if not, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you.